This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. We are on Theology of Everyday Life, Lesson 17, God's Calling, Living Where You Ought with Purpose. And last week we did the introduction, Um, and remember for this series we're we're challenging some some thoughts that are fairly normal, but we're comparing them to Scripture because what is common seems to be normal and what is normal seems to be right. Um, But that's not always the case, and our family, church, social influences all influence our view of um, things and we've been looking at several practical things. We've looked at food. We've looked at um, play. We've looked at my mind is slipping. What else have we looked at? Fasting. Um, anyway, we're looking at this concept of God's calling, and I think maybe if I went back and redid this lesson, I'd I'd add the word primary calling because this is mostly focused on the primary calling of God. But we are right now on page three at the top, biblical terms for calling. Now, to be completely honest with this, there are more than three biblical terms for calling in the New Testament. There's a, off the top of my head, I think there's about 20. But these are the three main big hitters, all right? Um, The ones that appear the most and match the sense in which we're referring. We're not talking about when, you know, Andrew called Peter to come and see Jesus. We're not talking about that type of calling. Um, So let's look at this word, kletos. um, And we're going to look at several references, some of which we may end up um, opening our Bibles to the broader passage. Uh, But you'll notice every time the word's used, it it will be underlined um, for you. Matthew 20, verse 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. This is coming out of that parable where the man goes to the uh, market. He hires laborers for a day. Um, they are each agreed to pay. They're each agreed to be paid. I don't know what it was, like twenty pieces of silver or something. They were paid a day's wage, um, and even the guys who came at the last hour of the day and only worked one hour, they all received the same wage. But they were all called by the master there, um, and anyway, Matthew twenty two fourteen, for many are called, but few are chosen, okay, that's repeated from the same, uh, it's kind of a, it's repeating from the same element, it's all in one discourse there, Romans 1, 6, among whom ye also, whom ye are, excuse me, among whom ye are also the called of Jesus Christ, Romans 1, seven, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Romans 1, 6, and 7, take a guess. What is Paul writing about in these beginning verses? What's this whole context? What's he doing when he's, when he's talking to these Romans? Romans is 16 chapters long. We're in the beginning of the first chapter. What is he doing at the beginning here? He's, oh, oh, what's that, Leroy? Okay. He's opening with just a greeting. He's greeting them as brothers and sisters in Christ. He's he's basically giving a long hello um, that involves praising the Lord. Um, and he's referring to them as the called of Jesus Christ. Um, he refers to them as beloved of God, called to be saints. He's referring to who they are. Now, had Paul visited Rome at this point? 
No, he had not. <laughs> when no one else wants to be wrong, let the kid do it, right? Um, no, he hadn't met any of these believers yet. In fact, in chapter 15 of the book, he's desirous to go meet them and see them. But he recognizes they're, they're called. He, he's, never believe, he've never, he's never met them, and yet he knows they're called of Jesus Christ, and they're called to be saints. Uh, and then he kind of closes out his greeting in verse 7 there. Romans 8.28. This is a, a famous verse, one that we like to put on plaques and whatnot on the wall. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Um, it's interesting. We like to put the phrase, we, all things work together for good to them that love God. Um, Sometimes we even cut off to them that love God. All things work together for good. Um, but the whole verse says, if you love God and you're called according to his purpose. 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Uh, again, another greeting, just like the Romans greeting. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. A call appears twice in that verse. The one that's underlined, the first one, um, called to be saints, is the word we're looking at here. The other is a different word. Um, 1 Corinthians one twenty four. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Jude 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Revelation seventeen fourteen, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now all those so far are, we're called to Christ and to be Saints. Um, that word is usually used in that sense. Do you have something? Um, in Romans eight twenty eight, uh-huh. would, would the word there be a little different? Because it is not the Greek word that we use in the Bible. Let me look. Um, it could. I can't remember. Now you're testing me. I, I think I went off just the lemma, which is the, the dictionary form of the word. Uh, let me look that up. Um, but I might have went off the root word, and if I went off the root word for that search, then what that means is, um, if I went off the root, then it would pull both the nouns and the verbs. Okay. It's not quite as uh, precise, but it gives you a broader perspective. Um, I think I went off the route there. So the she the called. Okay, so who are who are the called? So that's functioning as a noun. Let me make a note of that. And the worst I can do is look it up. Right. Yeah. Okay, so who are the called? And so it's part it's the object of the preposition, isn't it? Preposition. Ooh, are you pulling up like a study Bible note on us? <laughs> Diagram it. Diagram it. Try to understand it better. You're crazy, but some of this stuff. Yeah, there you go. Um, I have that. I have, um, I have several tools in, in my library that, that do that and do it in different ways. Um, so I will look into that this week. Um, good question, though. Um, because, well, let me, let me get on the tangent of that. So the verb would bring the sense of you're acting out the calling. 
you are acting as if you are called. But the noun is, it's giving you a title. You know, you are called. Um, and that fits well with others. Um, let's see. Uh, of course not. <laughs> Strong's is going to give you the, the smallest little boop. Um, you don't have Laonida, do you? Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, but we also have, with just this called, um, look at Revelation seventeen fourteen, King of Kings, and they that are with him are called, and they are chosen, and they are faithful. So th- in the sense of a noun, it's, it's reminding us of our position in Christ, our position before the throne. It's very easy for us to forget who we are, um, which is why Ephesians chapter 1 opens up with, we are seated with him in heavenly places. That's important to understand our position in Christ. Uh, If we don't understand who we are in Christ, if we don't understand our position, if we don't understand the righteousness that's been given us in Christ, then what will we tend to act like? We'll tend to act like the world. Okay, so I um, I don't know who I was talking to. Oh, now I do. Anyway, this last week I was talking with somebody, and they got talking about AA. And they had been a, an alcoholic and recovered. And they said one of the hardest things of them going to an AA meeting is they are constantly having to associate themselves with their problem. Hi, my name is so-and-so, and I am a alcoholic. Now, when you get in the middle of temptation and you get in the middle of, of a problem, it's just one step farther for you to think, well, since I'm an alcoholic and I'm always going to struggle with alcohol, it's just one step farther to say, well, I can't help it. This is just who I am. Do you see how that little, when we associate ourselves with a problem or a sin or this is the way I am, it leads us into just... I can't help it, and we'll go right into a sin. Yeah. (laughs) And we can do the same with that. There is truth in the song, I'm only a sinner saved by grace, right? And that's, that's a good truth to remember. But on the flip side of that, if we just focus on the fact I'm a sinner, and I can't expect to do anything better than sin, we've just set ourselves up for accepting failure. Uh, which is why I think Ephesians really highlights and emphasizes our position in Christ, because as as strange as this sounds, and it sounds Catholic, I think they've ruined the term for us, I am a saint. I may not be living like a saint, but I am a saint. I am seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And then when when you get to that point of temptation... It's not, I'm a saint, so I'm just going to sin. It's, I'm a saint, so I'm going to choose to live like a saint. Uh, does that make sense? Um, so, even the word called here, um, kletos, when it's used as a noun, brings and bears that we are called of God. We are his saints. Romans 1.7, called to be saints. Okay, um, And we are saints. Good, good feedback, and I'll dig in on that a little bit this week. Um, I separated two references here because they're a little different. Same word, but it's a calling to a specific task. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, Romans one one, called to be an apostle. Uh, Corinthians one one, First Corinthians one one, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. If we focus on God's calling on our life to live like Christ, will we care about the specific task God has asked us to do? What's that? We shouldn't, right? And it's, it's at the top of page four or bottom of three. I can't, I, it's the, if we focus on God's call in our life to live like Christ, 
Will we care about the specific tasks he's called us to do? Um, she said, um, Donna said, um, we shouldn't. We, sh- we shouldn't care. Um, and that's right. We shouldn't care about the specific task God's called us to do. We should be willing to do whatever. If we're honest, do we care half the time? Normally, normally we, don't we all get uptight when things go wrong? And when, when trials and obstacles come our way, we know that God's in control. We know we're called of God. We know all things work together for good. But how many of you are like me and you get uptight? <laughs> and you don't... Well, we have liars in our midst. <laughs> um, so I think the specific task is, a, is an outflow of understanding I am called to be a saint. I'm called to live in the center of God's will. Uh, did you have something to add to that? Or? I guess I'm taking it a little differently because if we're really recognizing that call on our life, I, I look at the word care as taking more care or more desire to do those specific tasks. So I guess I... I okay. And, and that, that, I think, fits with what we're saying. Is if, yeah. if you've accepted that, that general call of God on your life and you recognize you're called to be a saint, you're called to live as, you know, in Christ, then you're going to want to live that out through the specific tasks. Paul here lived it out through his call to be an apostle, um, and we will live that out through the calls God gives us as well. Um, so I think, I think they go hand in hand. I just didn't say it. In a way that made it hand in hand. So, any comments, questions before we move to our next word? And I understand if you walk away and you say, "I don't even know what these Greek words are." That's okay. I don't care. Um, what these searches are doing is they're getting us to look at verses that deal with God's calling in our life, and by doing that, we're narrowing our focus of Scripture down to a topic or a word um, <coughs> for thoughts and reflection. Um, the second word here is klesis, which sounds a little similar. Um, and this is God's call. Um, God's call is a way of living in relationship with him rather than a specific task or operation. Uh, it's very similar to our previous word, Romans eleven twenty nine, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. 1 Corinthians 1, 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. 1 Corinthians seven twenty. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Ephesians 1, 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. If you remember, I'd already mentioned Ephesians really centers on our position in Christ in the heavenlies. We are saints. And so here it's, it's pulling that calling aspect right into that. Ephesians 4.1 I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the Here the word vocation is used, but it's the same word for calling. Worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Um, So here, you noticed, probably the reason they translated that vocation is because there's the word called in the next phrase. The vocation wherewith ye are called. So they probably, I mean, it's a complete legitimate translation, so they probably did it that way so it didn't sound redundant. Um, But anyway, uh, the calling wherewith ye are called. Again, I am not a translator, so that's my guess of why they translated that way. Um, Ephesians 4.4 4, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are, ye are called in the hope of your calling. Philippians 3.14 I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 2 Thessalonians 1.11 Wherefore, 
Also, we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. 2 Timothy 1.9 Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Hebrews 3 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of heavenly uh, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. Second Peter 1 10. Wherefore, er, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fail. Up until this point, all the various reference we've read, what, what would you say is the primary sense of this word call? What's it talking about? Okay. Is it really calling us to duty? Okay. He wants us to live that way. I would argue he's calling us to relationship. And that's going to that's going to come out with how we live. I would say it's a call to duty when applied or when when it's necessary. Okay. As EMS personnel, you have a scope of practice. Mhm. That's a that's a probably a helpful way to look at it. A young Christian, I can tell you how I got saved. Yeah, and that's. I can't lead you into full depth of revelations. And yet, they can lead you. Everybody should, as a believer, can lead somebody somewhere. The fact is, when um, if I'm get my name straight, when Philip goes to Nathaniel in John chapter one. And says, we found the Messiah. We found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What was Nathaniel's response? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Yeah, right. Philip's rebuttal is incredibly simple. He says, well, you just come and see. He couldn't argue with him. <laughs> he didn't have, he didn't have a, a leg to stand on with argument. Nathaniel was well studied in scripture. And he said, come and see. And when Nathaniel came and saw and encountered Christ for the first time, all of, our, all of his arguments were put to waste. And Jesus made that statement, you know, before Philip called you, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. Whatever that meant, it meant something significant to Nathaniel. And he said, you're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. He recognized that not because of Philip's arguments, but because of the reality of Christ and encountering him for himself. I think when we look at calling, and, and like I said, this is probably better titled God's primary call. God's calling us, he has called us. Maybe that's a better way to say it. It's not just he's calling, but he has called us to live as saints to live in relationship with him, to live on the life of Christ. And when we do that, we're going to be drawing others to the Savior. We're going to be exposing them. Uh, whatever level we're at with understanding in the Scripture, um, I don't have the answer for that, but why don't you just come and see? Yeah, Leroy. Like How so, Leroy? How does it sound like our world? Isn't that what we do too, though? We tend to make our own decisions. We tend to think what's best. Uh, one of the traps we like to fall into is thinking that, okay, I'm a believer, I'm saved. I am going to do big things for God. But that's not the primary thing that God wants. God wants you more than he wants something done. God wants you in relationship with him, and God's going to use you to do great things. But if you try to accomplish things for God, and it's you for God, not you with God, 
Yep, God working through you is what you're looking for. Um, and then God's giving the direction, the guidance. He's giving the strength, the enablement. He's going before you, and that is that is how it should be done. So, comments, questions. I think I'm hitting lots of rabbit trails today, but so far time has been very forgiving. Okay, there we go. All right, the last word we'll look at <coughs> is kaleo, which is a verb. Um, it's the com- most commonly used word, and because it's most common, I really filtered down the, the list of verses. Otherwise, this verse list would have been about 200 long, so we really cut it down. Um, in the Gospels, this word is usually referring to a person speaking to another person. And in the epistles, it's usually... Um, the call of God refers to our relationship with Christ and or the effects of that relationship. So here's some verses dealing with where kaleo comes in. And some of these you'll, you'll say, hey, we already read that. I understand it was, it's where the two Greek words show up together in a verse. Romans 8.30 Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So we're talking about here those who God knew and those who God understood these people are going to be saved, they're going to be called, they are, they're going to be justified, and they will be glorified. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.9 God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, here we're called into fellowship. Uh, 1 Corinthians one or First Corinthians seven fifteen. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Uh, now this one's a little different. This is more down to earth practical, isn't it? <laughs> Talking about First uh, Corinthians seven, when an unbelieving spouse or when a spouse gets married, and and or when two are married, one is a believer, one is not a believer, and at Corinth at that time, they were saying, well, since one of us is a believer and he's not, then I'm unequally yoked, so I'm going to get a divorce and get out of the marriage because now I'm a believer and they're not. And Paul's saying, whoa, 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 hold, hold it. <laughs> if, if, they are, if they're confined living with you and you exercising your faith, uh, don't pull out of the marriage that way. Um, he's talking about that and he says, look, but God hath called us to peace. Um, very practical. Uh, same chapter, 1 Corinthians seven seventeen. But God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. 1 Corinthians seven eighteen. Is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? Let him not be circumcised. And two verses later, 1 Corinthians seven twenty. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. 1 Corinthians 7.24 Brethren, let every man wherein he is called, um, wherein he is called, therein abide with God. I think this chapter is really helpful, and maybe I should have turned there and read the whole thing. Um, because sometimes God, he has, in the big sense of God's calling on our life, he has called us to relationship and fellowship with him, and the outflow of that will be service for him in some way or another. But generally, God has placed us in circumstances and positions in life that can direct that specific calling of God. Uh, I have a friend who is working with public schools, doing different programs. His background is one of such. He, he knows what it is to deal drugs. He's been there. He's done that. He knows what that whole lifestyle is like. So when he comes into a public school as someone who has kicked it and who has, is no longer involved in that scene and now has a family and kids, and from the public school perspective, that is a, hey, somebody who did it, we want them as an example, right? Because, hey, they've been there. They've made those bad choices. They can tell you what it's like. Now, for my friend, does he have a voice of experience that he can take to the public schools that I do not have? 
You bet he does. And God can take even the sins of our past and use them for good. Now, he and I could stand up and say the exact same thing at the public school. But would it have the same effect? Probably not. God equips us for what he calls us to, and sometimes we can. it's very easy to lament, oh, I didn't get saved till later in life. I have baggage, or I didn't do this till later. I wish I would have done that. But in the course of all what we did wrong, God can use that to open up opportunities for us in the future. Uh, for some of us, it's like, I made a mistake in high school, I did this wrong, I did that wrong, I didn't handle this right, I didn't do that right. And then when your kids are coming along and thinking along the same lines, you're going, let me tell you about when I did that and how it turned out. And you don't want to go down this path. Now, granted, I know our children don't like to believe us and they don't like to listen, but you may also be that voice of influence to someone else's kids. There's this odd thing that Sometimes when a kid won't listen to their parents, they sometimes listen to someone else. Um, they tend to listen to their friends. But uh, at any rate, if they'll listen to you, you might be able to say, hey, been there, done that. You don't want to go there. And so God, in his calling and how he's going to use us and how he's going to let us influence um, others, he often uses the experience we've had and been through. He, he prepares us for things, whether we realize it or not. Comments or questions before we um, keep going here? All right, I have a lot of verses left. Okay, Galatians 6, or 1, 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Galatians 1, 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Galatians 5.13 For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty as an occasion for the flesh, but by love serve one another. Ephesians 4.1 I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Um, remember we had that one before, vocation was the other word. Ephesians 4, four. there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called and one hope of your calling. Colossians 3.15 And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are, also, ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. 1 Thessalonians 2.12 That ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. 1 Thessalonians 4.7 For God hath not called us to uncleanliness, but unto holiness. First Timothy 6.12 Fight the good fight, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. First Peter 2.9 But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, an holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter twenty, or I'm sorry, two twenty one. Oh, did you have something there? Oh, yeah. I'm just kind of plowing at this point through verses, hoping to to get it on time. First Peter two twenty one. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. First Peter five ten. But the God of all grace, who hath called us into His eternal glory. By Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. First, Second Peter 1, 3. According as his divine power hath given us unto all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. We talked about a little bit about this last week, but why do you think people experience a midlife crisis and how can understanding God's call help with that? As we've gone through these three words on calling, how can, just broadly looking at that, help understand how that applies? Think of Abraham. Okay. He knew God had called him out of places and to go to other places. Right. And each time he failed once he got there. Um, I think specifically of Egypt. He gets there and he doesn't want them to mess with him, so he says... Here's my sister, yeah. his wife. We're the same way. Of, I know I'm supposed to do this, 
but I don't know quite what to do, so here, do this instead. He was called of God, but when things got rocky, he responded in fear instead of faith. And boy, every time he did that, he ended up in a mess. Um, And don't we all? We end up in the same mess. Okay, with God's calling here, out of all those verses, there were two verses where it's called to be an apostle, focusing on a specific task. The rest of them, what did they focus on? Okay, every, <laughs> we are the called of God, are we not? Yeah. It's focused on who you are in relationship to Christ. Now, a midlife crisis happens because we look at our life and we're not where we think we ought to be. I'm not, I haven't made enough money. I haven't started my retirement plan. I haven't done this. I haven't accomplished that. I, I, I guess I was at one of those youth rallies and the guy was preaching and he talked about something I've never heard of and I heard it a few times. A bucket list. Have any of you heard of that? Okay. Is it? Is that where it's from? Yeah. It's, it's a list of things that you want to do before you die. It's these two guys that were dying. Okay. So they make a list of things they want to do before they die. And so for some of us, our bucket list is really small. For others, you know, we put all sorts of things in. I want to climb Mount Everest. I want to go to Yellowstone. I'm not actually saying I do. I'm just saying this is what people do. I could care less about climbing Mount Everest. Um, it might be a location list, places you want to visit. But as, as we get older, we realize there's a lot of things I thought I'd do by now that I haven't got done. <laughs> and it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Um, and then these people will hit this midlife crisis where they Maybe they go out and spend a bunch of money and buy a fancy car they thought they'd have as a teenager and never did, and or, or whatever they do there. Um, they recognize, ah, I haven't got done what I wanted to get done. But if we understand our position in Christ, will we have that same response? Well, I think that discontentment comes with the midlife crisis. I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm tired of this. I'm not content. So if, if we were responding more with God's call, I don't think that discontentment would take hold as much. That's, that's probably the best way to say it. The discontentment at that age, we get, center, we get focused on that, and with that discontentment, we forget about God's call, and, and it drives us to try to fill that void. Yeah. Mm-hmm. got down to the last three. One came to him at his deathbed and got saved. The other two rejected him at his deathbed but got saved at his funeral. Yeah. Uh, same story I think is true of George Mueller. He had some people he was praying for for salvation, and they didn't get saved till after he died. Um, and and that's, that is a reality, too is when God is in charge of your life, your life is not simply the 50, 60, 70, 100 years here on earth. You recognize that your life is a little puzzle piece in in the mosaic of God's puzzle. And God has put this all together. Your life is one piece to the puzzle, which is why a guy like Robert Marfa labored all his life in China with a grand total of eight converts in the scope of missions, that's not a great big success from a human standpoint. But he laid the groundwork for guys like Hudson Taylor and Jonathan Goforth and John Nevis and others who went to China on his heels. And God opened the doors of China. So the, the calling of God, when you see that purpose, okay, I understand I am serving a God who is bigger, smarter, wiser, and has a longer term plan than I can ever imagine. And my life, if I am called, and I'm not discontent because uh, I've been doing the same thing for 30 years, but I recognize that God is using this and I don't always know the ends. That goes back to our introduction. Some of what gets us down and discouraged is we don't see the fruit of what's going on. 
But when you recognize God has a purpose, God has a plan, my life may seem menial, meaningless, but God has a purpose. And when we hold on to that and understand God has called us to this, I am pleasing God, we're not going to be discontent because, well, we're not seeing the big results. We're not seeing uh, this or that. Uh, it'll The focus needs to stay shifted on the Lord instead of on results or ourself. Um, so if you kind of conclude these thoughts here, I've said this over and over, I think, through the lesson. When referring to God's call in our lives, the Bible focuses on, one, is our relationship with Christ, and two, is holy living. Called you to peace. Called you to... Um, my mind is slipping. Called you to liberty. Called you to His grace. He's called us to live holy, and He's called us to live in relationship with Christ. And it's clear that God has specific calls for us. Okay, We talked about, already here, Abraham. He was called to leave Ur of the Chaldees. Um, Paul, he was called to be an apostle. But these specific calls stem out of the main call, and that is for us to live in relationship with Christ and to live holy. I'll close out with this quote. If we focus on answering the call of living holy and radiant lives in Christ, God will certainly use us in powerful ways, no matter where we've started. I think that's a good way to bring it kind of all in. Those calls are working together. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you have called us into a relationship with you. Lord, we could never call ourselves into that. We could never even fathom that an eternal God who made the worlds would want that. And yet you've opened up the way and you have called us into that relationship with you. You've called us to live holy. You've called us to live as Christ. Lord, would you help us this week to focus our attention and our eyes on you and and the position you've given us in Christ. And Lord, would we live that out in the day-to-day decisions of life. We ask this in your Son's name. Amen.